Okay, this is just background stuff, shows the vehicle on the pad. Uh, this shows Bob Crippen uh, getting ready to fly. And uh, there's me, and uh, you can see my big project the week before flight was uh, getting uh, bigger United States flags put on our pressure suits. <laughs> and the reason for that was uh, one of these bureaucrats told me that it had to be a small flag to balance the space shuttle program, and I pointed out to him that the United States was bigger than the space shuttle program. <laughs> This shows us uh, in the van, the traditional van that had been carrying Apollo crews out uh, that we rode out and going into the white room of the vehicle. Everybody had to wear those little masks theoretically for our last week there so that uh, we wouldn't contaminate them or something. They found that nobody at the Cape got sick from us <laughs> being around them. This is uh, shutting up the hatch uh, just prior to launch and that's a John said it gets kind of lonely out there. This is high-speed ignition of the, the uh, three main engines. The vibration in the cockpit was very low at this time uh, after the engines light off. The instruments just a little blurred, but you could read every one of them. And look at those babies come up to speed. What this is shadow. the cockpit. Shows how the vehicle moves back and forth there. And this is high-speed photography of the bolts blowing and the solid rocket motors lighting off. And all that this uh, water spray right there where they're trying to keep things cool and not having much luck. And this is very high speed photography because when it lit off, there was a couple of thumps and we started moving up very slowly. These are high, these are, look at these beautiful shocks coming out of the main engines at liftoff and it's moving a lot faster than that. This shows how close it comes to the intertank access arm, which has always worried me some. <laughs> it's really getting up and going. John and I expected a real hard kick in the pants uh, there shows that what it looked like out John's window. It called tower clear right from the cockpit. But it was actually a really very smooth liftoff with very little shaking associated with it. There's the road program to head us out over the ocean. And the vehicle is, uh, the cockpit vibration is such that you can still read all your instruments in there and uh, maybe it's uh, maybe 10 cycles per second. This shows the roll program from inside the cockpit out the side window and it's uh, a thing of beauty. It's just as smooth as glass. There's no accelerations involved. And this shows uh, the vehicle speed uh, picking up. It's probably about ready to go supersonic right now, almost going straight up. And uh, we said that's what it's going to do, but I didn't really believe it would, but it did. <laughs> we were uh, getting a little loft on our trajectory here that we're still analyzing right now. Also, I was seeing some debris coming off uh, from up over the nose that was coming back and uh, hitting the windscreen and going over the top of the vehicle that uh, we weren't sure what it is, uh, like ice or soapy, uh, that's the stuff on the external tank that they're still analyzing. I believe that tail is about uh, 750 feet long and maybe uh, you can see it better from here, uh, maybe six, 700 feet long, maybe uh, 150, 200 feet wide. It's really impressive. I'm glad we couldn't see that. <laughs> Thank goodness for no rearview mirror. The ride was, was very smooth throughout this. Up in the uh, transonic phase, it shook just a little bit. They're coming through max Q. This is a, a camera inside the, exter uh, inside the orbiter from the ET doors and shows the external uh, solid rocket motor separation. Isn't that a spectacular shot? And then we show it again from inside the cabin, although the light is much brighter than this. The and big then, flash across the windscreen. This shows that we never saw these pictures, but here's the picture of a separation outside uh, from high-speed cameras. And isn't that terrific? Uh, from onboard sensations, the only thing we really saw was uh, the flash of light and our normal avionics cues that we had dumped the solids. We did not see them go away nor feel any jokes. We're less than 1G right after separation transverse Gs, and this baby's just chugging along, and it's just as smooth as glass. That ride is. Here you see some particles coming by John's window, a couple of white objects. There weren't one that uh, was indicative of the kind of stuff that we've been seeing uh, throughout the uh, flight. This is uh, back in a, this is umbilical t separation back in that uh, view that we saw, and this is external tank separation. And it is a spectacular sight. That white particles you see there are ice uh, caused by the, the hydrogen freezing as it's coming out and perfectly nominal. There's the, uh, the hit fitting that goes up in the orbiter. There's the umbilical plate, and there's the tank. And as you can see, all this black material there, that's the way the soapy works. It chars and turns black. So it was a high heating area in there, and it really caught it. And there's another place that's sort of discolored up here. 
toward the nose of the tank. There was supposed to have been a tumble valve actuate to start uh, the vehicle tumbling, uh, and it did not work. And it, from our standpoint, it gave us a, a much better view of the tank. You'll also see the nose uh, discolored. It almost looks like the nose is uh, it's got all the sophie gone from it because there's a, a sort of metallic color there, but that might be bright sun. Yeah, we're, we're not sure of that, and uh, people are analyzing that still. Uh, this is a scene of me uh, climbing, out of the, climbing out of the seat. Uh, all of the operations associated with the suit and the seat while you're in zero-G are, are much easier to handle than it is down here on Earth. I'm just stuffing the... Uh, the helmet and a, a little bag along with the gloves so that we can, we can tuck them away. There's quite a few connections associated with that suit, but uh, it's no real problem to handle at all in zero G. In one G, we had a lot of problem with this helmet. It was always bumping into the hand controller and firing things. There you see it's up there out of the way. We finally got it right. <laughs> that floats nicely. I'm not going to tell you this picture was made right after we got into orbit because I don't think either one of us is that, that gutty, but we made it later on and then ran it backwards. <laughs> Actually, we did a suiting exercise while we were on orbit just to make sure that we could get the suits and get back in the seats uh, with no problem, and that's, uh, that's when we filmed this. This uh, is two TV cameras uh, muxed together, uh, one on the left and one on the right, shows the initial payload bay door opening. Uh, all of that went, went nice and smooth. You'll notice uh, the Ohm's pod coming into view right here. This is the first time we saw some, uh, some tiles missing off of the Ohm's pod. You notice the door kind of hesitates when it opens, too. It did this in a fixture on the ground, and they told us, well, that was due to the fixture. That's the way the door really works. The camera on the right is, is an aft camera looking forward. You can see the windows coming. The one on the, uh, on the left is a forward camera looking aft. Uh, all those, that door operations went uh, as smooth as it could be, which uh, I was mighty happy because I didn't particularly care about the thought of going outside and trying to, trying to do anything associated with them. This is a view, a pan in the outside that shows the radiators deployed out there. That's a beautiful, uh, beautiful shot with the t television. You can also see those radiators when you look out your forward windows, which uh, surprises us a little bit. This is uh, an ops... Uh, Mode 8, check out of the hand controller. You move it full throw, and then you read on the cathode ray tube, which is where I'm looking, uh, to see if the hand controller is working properly. And this is very exciting. A little bit of this will last you about six months. <laughs> <laughs> this shows a camera forward in the cockpit looking aft, and uh, with John coming out of the seat, uh, this was actually some TV stuff that we did for a status report. Pretty good. At indication of the kind of problems we have with some of our comm lines, which uh, you had to work pretty hard to make sure you didn't get tied up in those things. And we stayed tied up in them the whole flight. The government is now looking at wireless mics that I think will really improve the capability of the crew to operate. As you can see there, I'm having to hold mine uh, next to my mouth so I can talk to people. This is a shot down on our mid-deck storage area where we uh, had all of our stuff stowed, and uh, this was actually just after the press conference, or not press conference, after the conversation we had with the vice president. Uh, zero G is something else. That is uh, something that all of you should have an opportunity to, ex to experience. It is really fun. You know, if you could do that in your living room without breaking your leg, you sure would. <laughs> There's no problem trying to restrain yourself anywhere down there. I'm uh, in the process here of changing out one of our Lyo canisters, which is used to, uh, that we run the air through to take out all the CO2 and any contamination. It's a very easy job. We had a couple of troughs down there where we stow uh, Lyle canisters, and you could just put your legs down in there and kind of push them apart, and it restrains you very nicely. Look at this. Uh, this shows the mobility that we have down the mid-deck. People thought we needed restraint systems to tie ourselves down in there. You don't need any of that. Now, watch this mobility that Bob has when he kicks off and goes up uh, to the top side. Boy, I'll tell you, if that isn't the neatest thing in the world. The thing about it is, you don't really go flying around. Uh, it, you need to move a little bit slowly, otherwise you'll end up banging into something. But uh, there's no problem controlling yourself any place you want to go. <laughs> try that. Try that in one gravity and you, see where it gets. You see, I just was wearing my socks there. I never put any shoes on while you're on orbit. I don't like to when I'm in the house either. So. 
it shows what the television will show you out the window and shows what a great view those spectacular windows gave us. Here's another television view of the Earth. Now we're coming up to the reason I was glad I was flying with a guy like John that's got all the experience. We're getting ready to come home and uh, sitting beside a man that knows space testing like he does made you feel mighty good. We're shutting the doors and all of that again went just like, uh, just like we wanted it to. It, uh, there were no problems at all associated with it. You can notice there's a little bit of jerky motion when it comes down. We were lowering the uh, starboard door down easy and you'll notice it bounces pretty good uh, which we're having to pass on to other following crews to make sure that when they close it they can don't have any problem with overlap got her all tucked away and we're ready to come home now this uh, had them stretch this picture because in the real world there was a beautiful pink up here due to the heat this is the first part of entry and uh, there's the sunrise coming up and we're moving along at about 300,000 feet and we're just about to 265,000 feet where we go in our first roll reversal. And you'll see that pretty shortly. Now we're moving pretty fast, but not quite this fast. Yeah. <laughs> That's the first roll reversal. And here's the second roll reversal. It's done at Mach uh, 18 and a half, and this is at two frames a second. So we're moving six times faster than we would in, in the real world. 12 times maybe, yeah. Mach 18 and a half, and you really see those clouds go by even in the real, in the real world, but it's not quite this fast. But you certainly Our next roll reversal is at Mach 9.8. There it goes. We did the roll reversal a little bit slower than that, too. Yes. <laughs> and here we come back at the 4.8 roll reversal, and that's Bakersfield out there. Coming across the Hatchby in the, in the Sierras. And the vehicle sort of rolls rings level, and uh, this is about at 80,000 feet, and then we went to real-time photography, which is only twice as fast as happens in the real world, and as you can see, everything has slowed down quite a bit. We're pretty high right now, maybe 75, 80,000 feet coming across uh, the lake bed areas that we told you all about. There's uh, China Lake up in that area, up in there, and you can see it out the, the left window. There's Cuddyback, there's Pork Chop Lake coming into view at the top. Right at the top. We're coming out to swing around the heading alignment circle, and uh, it sure is a beautiful view. Looking out that window, you can see everything you need to see. There was just no doubt in our minds that we knew exactly where we were in the flight, even uh, by comparing uh, what we had on our normal ground track with what we're seeing on the instrument. There are three sisters up there. The right end up to this point uh, had been nice and smooth, and the vehicle controls really tight. It's a nice handling space. Chase plane joint up there. And we're uh, getting ready to go in the turn around what we call our heading alignment circle. That's uh, the Mojave River, which is a, mainly a dry lake bed, a dry riverbed out there. Uh, John is, in, is driving a vehicle at this, this point in time, and, uh, and it really handled nice. We were right down the middle of the corridor all the way. Remarkable thing about the space shuttle is it's all electric, and uh, the, when you move the wings somewhere, they stay there. You put the nose somewhere, and it stays there. It's just just an admirable handling vehicle. You couldn't ask for anything as, as responsive and as, uh, for this kind of a job, it does it exactly like you, you want it to. Couldn't have ordered a, a better day for coming back in. We could have navigated visually all the way from when we hit the coast, which was just a little less than Mach 7 up uh, south of the San Francisco area, all the way down the San, San Joaquin Valley to the Edwards. It was no problem knowing where you were at any time. There's the highway. Uh, north of Edwards there and you swing across the uh, lake bed and uh, it's kind of hard to see at first in these films but there's the old aim point right there. We're starting to come down the glide slope and the runway's uh, still hard to see there. We have some uh, aim lights that give you an indication of what your glide slope is out there that we refer to as Pappy lights. Uh, we also uh, had locked onto a microwave landing system and all of those ended up agreeing right on as to where we were, no doubt whatsoever. Here's our old chase plane. He's flying back and forth across the bottom of the vehicle taking pictures uh, to see uh, if there's any tile damage uh, that would not show up. You know, they thought they might get some from the rocks and everything on the desert floor, so he's covering that right now. And chase plane did a real terrific job. The vehicle is very easy to control in this flight regime. We're about into pre-flare right now. You know, I was flying about uh, 285 knots at this point. We're like about a 20 degree glide slope. Everything was just as smooth as could be. 
There's a, we're going into pre-flare, and this is how it looks out the window. You may be able to see two or three of those lights. Uh, two lights, two white lights is what we're looking for. There are two there. We start our pull-up now, and there'll be uh, three. You'll see the third one come on. So we're on a 20-degree glide slope to pre-flare, which means we can only land uh, right down here at the touchdown point. Here's the wheels coming down. The wheels really snap down fast. They're much faster than what I anticipated them. And there's a couple of big black marks you'll see coming up here pretty soon. Oh, there they are. Touchdown. That's a touchdown point. And here we go, boy. <laughs> what a machine. It didn't know about that. Supposed to land on the touchdown point. <laughs> but, uh, actually, You should understand, John was not trying to touch down on the touchdown point. What we were trying to do was to find out what the real deceleration came and, and touch down about on an airspeed, which was about 185 knots. And uh, all of the ALT flights and this one ended up landing, landing long, which looks to us like we have uh, a little bit more lift capability than what, what had been predicted. And we rolled right up here so uh, Kennedy Space Center's uh, recovery team could get a hold of us and hook the cooling up as fast as possible. We rolled into the runway intersection. We did that on purpose, so we hardly used any brakes on this rollout. And there's the vehicle sitting, and she is a beauty. That's, uh, believe it or not, the weight of that vehicle right there is about a little, uh, right around 99 tons. I keep reading where it's uh, 150,000 pounds or 80 tons, but that one right there is 99 tons. That's quite a, cap quite a performance thing to put, to return from orbit with 99 ton spacecraft in the, Get her back all in one piece, I think. We had full moon on our first launch attempt, and it was pretty full the rest of the time. Made a pretty spectacular uh, evening for us every night. NASA has these cameras, these secret trick cameras that look right through your hair on the back of your head. I <laughs> this is a, a pretty ignition sequence. There's the mains uh, lighting. It was uh, not very noisy and very smooth, and you'll see some uh, shots here. You can see the igniters. Uh, horizontally into the flame. You also see the engines being uh, gimbaled there as a test just prior to liftoff. Those burn smooth, but boy, I'll tell you, when those solids lit, you really knew that something had hit you. There, there was, uh, uh, it was a really uh, a very big increase in vibration in the vehicle, driving over, like John said, driving over a real rough road, and that's really just about how it felt. But it, it sure was a nice, solid push getting off the pad. Roll maneuver was spectacular. Boy, that thing really whips around. There it is, rolling over. And that was really some kind of ride. And as Joe said, it, was, it just seemed like a rattling of the whole spacecraft when the solids uh, were burning. Wasn't so bad that you couldn't read checklists or read any of the displays or reach any of the switches, but, but it... Uh... Here's, now here's a beautiful view of uh, the Florida coastline. It's taken out my right window. Lay your head on your left shoulder is what looks right on this one. Off we go. This is, uh, there's the roll maneuver. Now this is uh, shown about twice the speed through a little cloud deck. There's a highway going up the east uh, coast of Florida and you can see uh, both the coastline and the, and the in inland uh, waterway. You know you all look super out there with your heads laying on your left shoulder like that. <laughs> Notice the uh, sky getting dark. Uh, finally, of course, it was got to be solid black. And just at the end of this sequence, you're going to see uh, two stars rise right about the center of the horizon there coming up. I think. I hope. There they come. That in the upper right hand. Just barely saw them. These pictures were taken from, uh, from our chase planes. And uh, luckily, we didn't have to use them down there at the Cape to come back in. 
but they were there ready. We ought to say a word for the recovery teams that recovered the solid rocket motors out of the ocean. The seas were terribly rough. Uh, this, this is a beautiful view of separation. You can see the three, the three main engines uh, lit and we're done with separation. The, just like John and Crip, the windows were completely enveloped in, in flame. At any rate, the seas were really rough the few days after the launch, and uh, those teams really did a super job to get the solid rocket motors out of the ocean. This is the uh, external tank separation at the end of the main engine, Miko. You could see a, a washer uh, coming out there. This cable that you see flapping around on the right-hand side of the picture is a part of the, uh, uh, the baggy installation that protects the, uh, the opening there at the fitting, at the tank fitting. And, uh, was really of no consequence, although I think like Dick and I, when we first saw it, we'd have been a little concerned about that thing flapping around out there, not knowing that it was or was not supposed to be there. You can see the tank tumbling also, and you notice the scorched bottom end of the tank, and as it tumbles around just at the end here, you'll be able to see where the solids were not shielding it. The flame pattern started lapping back up on the side of the tank there. This is a, uh, the fun starts here. Uh, on orbit. Here's a couple of uh, tourists <laughs> supposed to be working and telling Houston that they are, but really looking out the window and uh, having some fun. This is the area behind the ejection seats. Now we've switched to a view of, uh, with the payload cameras, of the uh, opening of the port payload bay door. There's the arm there stowed in the lower right in the OSTA experiment in the center of the payload bay. This was at night, so the light you're seeing is reflections from the lights that were on inside the payload bay, and there's the light shafting across the Ohm's pod and up the vertical stabilizer. Center of the payload bay here is the OSTA pallet, and uh, in the upper center, moving to the upper center of the picture now is the Sur A antenna, one of the major experiments on the OSTA pallet. SURA is a uh, synthetic aperture radar. This was really beautiful uh, sight, seeing the, uh, the uh, experiments in the payload bay and then looking up there and seeing the Earth. Just about the entire duration of the flight, we were oriented. Well, I'll dictate about that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who did that. <laughs> it's kind of a quick walkthrough from the elbow camera on the on the arm. Um, you look up there in the upper left-hand corner, you can see the camera looking back down into the payload bay, and that's where that picture was taken from. And I think this was one of the uh, t one of the TV pictures that came down. Uh, live but it was pretty but we had the best seat. The wireless mic uh, was a resounding success. You can see it strapped on my right thigh there and there I'm using the uh, push to talk button to talk to uh, Sally Wright I think who was uh, running the RMS from or talking to me from the control center during the RMS operations. And as Joe said, this is a earlier, this is a kind of a tour of the short tour of the orbiter from the elbow camera on the RMS. RMS was really smooth. It, uh, in all the modes we tested it, it was uh, just no surprises from the simulator. And uh, we had, uh, we did a maneuver, both of us did a maneuver up to the grapple fixture. Uh, as you know, we did not do a grapple on this flight. We, uh, uh, the STS-3 crew is, is going to do that, but I predict that they are going to like the way that the remote manipulator system uh, maneuvers in space. Just like all the people that have gone before us, we found that uh, one of the big problems was housekeeping and managing books and pencils would float by and you'd go down the mid-deck and there'd be a camera out in the middle or a 
so anything that we hadn't uh, tucked away would we'd find quickly. I think Dick is getting ready to to cradle the arm now. In this sequence, you'll see the how how the arm how he straightens the arm out, get it into position to bring it down down into the to cradle it. The uh, one of the cradle sequences that, that came down live, as a matter of fact, we have a short uh, clip of it here, uh, tends to make you think that the arm is uh, uh, kind of goosey, and I'll show it to you here, but actually it's just the, that was uh, not the primary mode, and it was one of the tests that we did. Actually, it was very, very smooth. And uh, the also, you can see the, the saddles that the arm sits in there in this picture. They actually roll out from uh, at the first of the flight, and they they were kind of rough when we tested them down at the Cape, uh, but they were very smooth in zero g. This is the this is the view that I was talking about. Each uh, this is uh, what we call the direct mode of the uh, RMS, but uh, the single mode is is the mode that eventually will be used operationally, and this just prove that uh, there are alternate ways to cradle. Because of the shortened mission, Dick ended up doing just about all the RMS work, and the only thing I was doing there was running cameras and making them go to the right places to get the right views of the, the RMS operation. We didn't have much time during the mission to get planned uh, television and planned photography inside the spacecraft. As a matter of fact, of the 850 pictures of the Earth that we took, I'm sure that uh, 800, 800 of them were taken after we put Houston to bed. But one thing we did do one night was, uh, one thing, it's all in how you look at it. <laughs> one thing we did do was uh, Joe set up a TV camera down in the mid-deck, and we just let it run for a while uh, while we ate our meal and did some things, and we just thought we'd show you uh, how much fun it is in zero-g, and uh, just as easy. I, I found in, in this particular scene that I was just tall enough so that my feet could touch the ceiling and my head could just touch that water tank, and uh, I could stay there all day, upside down or right side up, whichever. Notice the checklist out there in the middle of the mid-deck. Now, this is the part that sure beats working for a living, I'll tell you. <laughs> Just like a couple of porpoises or something swimming around. We had had the good fortune to um, to do some homework. Well, here's one of the experiments, uh, the uh, nighttime optical survey of lightning that uh, was meant to study uh, lightning patterns and uh, from uh, from orbit to uh, to look at different uh, patterns, not only from cloud to cloud but within the cloud itself. And uh, from the meteorology standpoint, there are just some spectacular clouds to be seen once you realize what's happening down there. Those of you out at Edwards are were watching, you notice these, these white puffs coming out. We were, we were not attempting to write Burma Shave, although Dick and I have talked about it <laughs> beforehand. These are exhaust plumes from the reaction control jets, the yaw jets, uh, responding to the inputs uh, of some of the latter um, program test inputs, the, the data maneuvers that we were flying to uh, determine the derivatives of the vehicle, the lateral directional uh, derivatives of the vehicle. Incidentally, the airplane throughout the entire entry and landing phase, to the best we could tell, was just as solid as a rock. It, it had uh, no overshoot, no oscillations that we feared might, we might see in some areas. Just a very steady, solid vehicle all the way down. 
final approach, you can see the chase plane out to the side there. Uh, we did switch runways. Uh, we were originally going to land on runway 15 and take advantage of a crosswind so that we could evaluate what the crosswind characteristics of the, of the uh, orbiter were as we landed. Uh, the winds actually picked up a little more than what we had uh, planned to try on our first, at least our first crosswind attempt, so we switched back around to runway 23 at Edwards and landed essentially into the wind with uh, practically no crosswind component with a pretty healthy headwind component. Columbia has uh, very little tile damage after this flight, which we think is really marvelous for a vehicle this size and uh, on only the second flight. That's not going to be a major problem in the turnaround. My main chore during the landing was to lower the landing gear, which incidentally went down right on time. <laughs> <laughs> and all the way. And all the way. There's a chase which did uh, super jobs. We rolled out about 7,000 feet. Uh, we did do a braking test on rollout, which was one of the, which was really our final flight test objective, if you will. And um, the braking test went well. Uh, we, I think, demonstrated. Of course, we had the headwind, so we stopped shorter than we would have with uh, with no wind. But we did stop the vehicle in 7,000 feet of ground roll. I think demonstrating that that uh, certainly the bird is capable of landing on our. 15,000 feet and probably our 10,000 foot designated runways with no problem. And I say we did light braking too. It, we certainly didn't go uh, to maximum braking on the, uh, maximum application on the brakes. We maintained between seven and eight feet a second deceleration rate. When we landed, I felt uh, perfectly normal except for the 350 pound person sitting on my shoulders. <laughs> uh, Seriously, that was the only uh, sensation that I really had when we got back on Earth was uh, just really felt uh, heavy, but after we walked around the bird uh, here for five minutes, uh, uh, that went away, and it was uh, then we were back in 1G. I told Dr. Kraft I thought that the only thing that's really bad about the orbiter is when you put 1G in it. Okay. Many of you were able to attend the launch, and uh, we hope that you enjoyed it as much as we did, although I'm sure that the view was not quite as unique. Uh, here's a picture of the big bird sitting on the pad with the uh, vertical assembly building in the background. Uh, we had banker's hours on this flight. We were able to get up uh, around uh, 5 or 6 in the morning, get uh, suited up, make sure our uh, suits worked okay, and uh, walk out. We took one big one look at the uh, big bird just before he walked into it, got in the uh, swing arm and walked across and got strapped in. Helped the ground crew check out the spacecraft, and uh, promptly at 11, she lifted off. <clears throat> we when, could... the, when the main engines ignited, there was a certain amount of shaking and rattling that was obvious. I was wondering if the solids had ignited, uh, but when they, when they uh, touch off, there's no doubt. There's uh, <laughs> a tremendous uh, feeling of commotion and power down there behind you, and a relentless push that is just adds up to the, the ride of a lifetime. Uh, there's nothing that will ever even remotely approach the feeling of uh, first stage on the solids. From uh, my right-hand window, uh, lying on, on the back, this is the view if you turned your head 90 degrees to the right and watched. Had a camera pointed out that way. You can see the roll maneuver. Then we went into the very thin overcast and quickly popped out the top. Like Gordo said, it was the uh, ride of a lifetime, uh, lots of vibration, lots of dynamics, and uh, uh, just a relentless push for eight and a half minutes into orbit. Uh, it just was a continuous, uh, compelling, relentless acceleration and push all the way up there. We were able to perform our functions and talk and do our job, but we knew we had a tiger by the tail. The first stage, uh, of course, burned for about two, minu two, two minutes and six seconds. Uh, I understand you had a good view of it as it came out the top of this cloud, a very spectacular shot. We were uh, 
Uh, VFR on top, as the pilots say, uh, very quickly uh, with uh, very little actual instrument time. The roll maneuver was uh, performed precisely, and um, uh, we uh, got the separation of the sol solid rocket motors at two minutes and six seconds. And uh, we didn't feel it or hear it, but we did see that flash of flame around the cockpit as the uh, solid rockets were jettisoned and uh, parachuted into the ocean where they were picked up uh, uh, so that they can be refurbished and used again. This is a close-up picture of the uh, solid rocket motor breaking away from the uh, external tank. It's interesting that as soon as the solids uh, burn out and are jettisoned, uh, everything smooths out absolutely as smooth as glass. Uh, it's, it's the nicest ride, uh, smoother than any airliner any of you have ever flown on. Uh, we uh, got the main engine cut off at 8 minutes and 34 seconds. Uh, we waited for the external tank to be jettisoned. This is an underneath picture of the tank being jettisoned and uh, falling away from the spacecraft. Uh, uh, shortly thereafter, we ignited the uh, maneuvering engines to uh, put us into orbit. Uh, we made two firings of the uh, orbital maneuvering system. Uh, so after about it, uh, 45 minutes, we were in orbit and able to open the payload bay doors. If you look quickly, uh, that's Los Angeles, the uh, South Bay, Palos Verdes Peninsula, then on down to San Diego. Then a few seconds later, that's the Salton Sea and the Imperial Valley in California, which greeted us as we uh, opened that first payload bay door. The uh, sight was ex as spectacular for us as it was uh, for you, and as you see it in these pictures here, it was uh, truly a... Uh, a momentous event for us and uh, most impressive uh, the pictures uh, and the memories don't do it justice you just have to go back and do it again in order to <laughs> appreciate it fully the, the uh, morning of the first day was when we first uh, got the uh, the remotely controlled arm uh, made by the canadians in the business second day actually uh, jack if you remember <laughs> uh, <laughs> And Jack had discovered some tile missing out in front of the windshield. If you notice those uh, square, irregular uh, patches uh, in front of the windshield, those are actually missing white tile. So we moved the arm up uh, and got it over to the uh, right-hand side and looked along uh, on a kind of a grazing angle here, but had a view and found some more tile missing. Uh, however, those were, the, those were relatively insignificant. As it turned out, on entry, I've heard the number that the highest temperature noted on the top in the area of the missing tile was only 140 degrees or so. Actually, the tile didn't slow us down much. Uh, we knew that uh, lots of people would be concerned about it, and uh, so we uh, erased it from our thought and uh, went on to do the other business. Uh, we did have some bending from uh, one of the main engines uh, that uh, was with us for about uh, two to three days, which were reported. And, uh, it was determined what the venting was. Uh, this is the way it looked, however, when the sunlight shone on it uh, with a dark background. And uh, uh, as I mentioned, after about two or three days, it went away. Now an inside shot. I'm at the uh, manipulator operator station, and Jack has taken this movie right here as I uh, brought the plasma diagnostics package out of the payload bay for the first time. We put the uh, manipulator arm through uh, the loaded operations, that is, with an attached payload for the first time in its uh, ever, uh, and exercised all the very complex sequences that the manipulator arm has built into it. Uh, some of those involve manually positioning the arm, others uh, with the software doing it automatically, and the, uh, our job merely to monitor uh, for safety considerations. Uh, we operated the arm night and day, so when the sun went down, we turned on lights in the payload bay and found that they were uh, adequate to see it visually as well as operate our television system. Periodically, it would uh, show up in the overhead window as you see it pictured here, and uh, then it would be moved to the forward uh, uh, part of the spacecraft up over the nose to uh, make some measurements. And uh, it was spectacular to just to watch it uh, come real close and, uh, and uh, silently, uh, but smoothly move to its next point in the sequence. Uh, and uh, this gives you the full appreciation of the total spectacle of the background. Uh, this is a picture that was taken uh, as we were going over the Baja Peninsula in an ascending pass over the United States. I'm bringing the... Uh plasma diagnostic package back in to latch it back down uh, in its uh, mounting mechanism. And this was one of the uh, big questions on the flight, how well that mechanism would work. 
Uh, we found that the task was much easier, uh, easier than it had been done during any of the ground tests. In fact, the whole thing, which had been anticipated and planned to take maybe as much as 30 minutes, we did on three separate occasions in uh, less than five minutes each time. And finally, uh, here you see the arm being put back down in its uh, cradle, its mounting mechanism, and this uh, in a backup mode, which is, uh, which is the, the crudest mode. One, if the whole primary system failed, we tested that backup mode and found that that whole thing of uh, cradling the arm and rolling it inboard, as uh, we're doing here, was uh, very easily done, even with the uh, lack of instrumentation that the backup system gives you. One of the things we uh, really enjoyed the most about being there was the ability to get around uh, very quickly and easily. We could be anywhere in spacecraft in a flash. And uh, this is the head first approach uh, down through the hatch and uh, down to the mid deck uh, where we had uh, these stowage lockers in which we had uh, lots of uh, apparatus, equipment, clothing, and uh, uh, books and other kinds of things that we needed. If you didn't like the head first approach, you could do, always do the feet first one and uh, glide down just about that quickly and uh, be right where Mission Control wanted it to be. We had a number of uh, experiments in the cabin to, uh, to uh, take care of. This is the plant growth unit that operated perfectly through the entire mission. We would read the uh, temperature in the uh, six plant growth compartments uh, three times a day and uh, read those back to the ground. One of the things that you'd all enjoy is the ability to uh, manage uh, packages very readily and easily up there. No need to set anything down, you just uh, leave it float in space. Here uh, I'm working the electrofluoresis experiment. Uh, I've taken one of the sample columns uh, after it's been frozen in the, uh, in the uh, main apparatus and stowing it in a holder and putting it back in a uh, liquid nitrogen cooled uh, freezer that we had that kept that frozen throughout the uh, remainder of the flight and the trip back to Houston. The, uh, we had a hygiene area in which we could uh, wash up, uh, shave, brush our teeth, and so forth. And uh, uh, we had uh, soap and uh, running water, so it was uh, very easy to uh, keep yourself clean. And um, here's a picture of Gordo uh, establishing himself in that area. And why don't you move the coat there, Gordo, and get it out of the way. Thank okay. you. <laughs> and of course, one of the things Gordo had to do was uh, brush his hair every morning. Eating was a real pleasure, uh, of course. You know. It's impossible to knock your milk off the table up there, kiddos. It's, there's no way to get in trouble with mom. Uh, you just uh, leave things float around, and when you want them, you just grab them out of thin air, and uh, you can eat standing on your head or uh, however you please. When you say eating was a real pleasure and you hear it from Jack Lausman, you can believe it. He really means it. <laughs> The, uh, most of the food that we had was mixed with water, and uh, then we had a, a heater we could put it in if we wanted to uh, make it warm. Uh, we had an exerciser on board that we uh, used a couple of times, and uh, we could uh, position ourselves on it. It was a treadmill which was self-propelled, and uh, get our exercise with no hands. Uh, in the 10 minutes I ran on this treadmill, I think uh, we should figure out the number. Something like uh, 3,000 miles we traveled. <laughs> Here's a man who ran 3,000 miles in just a few minutes. But this was a, a new device that was added for this flight, and uh, we think it uh, performed very well and be a good addition for uh, future flights. And uh, we used it uh, two different times. Uh, we took the whole exercise thing very seriously, as you'll see. Uh, th this was not the only thing we did to keep in shape. Of course, you have to create work for yourself up in uh, space. Your body does less work uh, up there than it does when you're just lying in bed sleeping against the force of gravity. So we had to devise a number of uh, exercise routines. balancing act here. <laughs> now, not many of you can do this right here.
He doesn't put them on one leg at a time like everybody else. As, as soon as I uh, get this down, I'm going to get a Dorothy Hamill wig and try out for the ice cream. And, of course, Marines aren't happy unless they do their push-ups every day. That wasn't too tough, so, uh, you know, look, one arm. And if you want to, you can do foot-ups. Now, if you really got frustrated, you could do this. Well, you really can see we didn't do much work up there, and finally came time to come home. So we uh, got the payload bay doors closed, and, uh, and I got a wave off from mission control. But uh, finally, the next day, they decided they'd bring us in anyway. And uh, here are a few shots that uh, many of you were able to witness from the ground personally of the uh, orbiter making its approach and landing at uh, Holloman Air Force, at uh, White Sands uh, Northrop Strip there. Near Holloman Air Force Base. We provided lots of support for the whole operation there. The uh, entry was as, as spectacular as the uh, boost was uh, in terms of dynamics and, uh, and sensation and uh, excitement and high adventure. It uh, was a machine that slowed down from 25 times the speed of sound to zero in about uh, 25 to 30 minutes. And uh, it, had it, it felt like it just had the brakes on all the way and uh, we had uh, one of the uh, most spectacular quick tours at low altitude and high speed of the United States anybody will ever have. The uh, airplane was flown uh, manually uh, from uh, about 40,000 feet down to about 10,000 feet. Here's a picture out Gordo's window of what uh, he saw from inside. We are just uh, rolled into the right bank, turning uh, a 90 degree turn from our approach heading onto final approach. And as you uh, see the white sands come into view and look closely, the uh, runway uh, will become visible but then uh, go out of sight again. There's the, the approach to the runway right there. But uh, because of the uh, strong westerly wind, we had to crab to the right. Right now, Jack is engaging the audio system, and you can see it making a, a quick correction to the right, then back to the left. But with that uh, correction for the wind drift, it's hiding the view of the runway until we get down here a little closer, and you'll be able to see our aim point come into view. You'll see a triangle and a rectangle. We are actually aiming for the rectangle, and there's some lights in there, not readily visible till just about now, that helped us uh, determine that the guidance system had us exactly on the uh, proper glide slope. Okay, uh, we got it firmly established on the uh, inner glide slope, and um, and uh, then took over manually and uh, made the landing, and the. Uh, and the rollout. We used the whole runway, although we didn't have to. It would have been possible to have. Uh, stopped much sooner had it been uh, necessary. And uh, here is a final shot of the uh, uh, final part of the approach. Uh, Gordo got the wheels down at 275 knots, uh, right on the money. And uh, we uh, broke the rate of descent right in here, and uh, then landed and uh, made the rollout. I noticed that the uh, wheel, nose wheel was going down a little uh, more quickly than I wanted it to, and uh, had to hold it off some. In doing so, I. Uh, over-rotated a little bit, kind of popped a wheelie there, but uh, no harm done. And the, uh, the uh, Columbia made a good smooth rollout. Uh, at the end of it, we made a little nose wheel steering test and uh, stopped it uh, before the end of the, the uh, uh, drawn-out runway, although, as I mentioned, uh, we just used very light braking and could have stopped it much more quickly. We uh, assisted the uh, ground personnel uh, in securing the spacecraft and shutting down some of the systems. Uh, finally, they uh, decided to let us out, in spite of the fact that we wanted to stay a little longer, and met the sunshine there at the White Sands Missile Range. And uh, uh, we have apparently picked the right time to come because the wind kind of abated and let up for us, although it picked up later. The support at uh, White Sands was uh, incredible, and uh, it was a great team effort uh, with uh, NASA, contractor people, and the Department of Defense to provide a landing opportunity there in a very short time. So it's a tribute to our whole American team for the way that the final part of our flight worked out.